Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. How do you instill a love of sports in a child's life? Now, if it isn't sports, then perhaps it's reading, or theater, art, dance, music. Do you say, okay, here's a book, read all about it, you'll be just fine. Just be back in time for dinner. Well, you may be thinking, well, that's not going to get you very far. I would take them to see a game or go to a concert. We would have fun. I would let them experience it for themselves. I would be there to explain everything, and if I didn't know the answers, I would find somebody who did. I might even sign them up for lessons or have them join a team. I would support them by making their interest a priority in my life. Having been to numerous soccer games in the cool of October, trying to stand just right so that the sun will warm my face, I have watched my children start out playing like one of the, like a, a, a swarm of little bees following the soccer ball down the field. Having been to those sporting events, I truly appreciate coaches. I have seen good coaches and bad ones. What intrigues me about the good coaches is that playing on the team is more than just learning the rules, more than winning. The coaches are there when the team loses. They're there when they win. They are there in the hard times and the good times. Coaches have an insight into how each player responds to those circumstances. They also have the vantage point of time. They get to see progression, or not, in skill development. They get to see a group of individuals come together and form a team. When it is windy and cold, coaches teach that the practice must go on. When everyone is tired and wants to give up, coaches keep the ball rolling. They speak words of encouragement, which may be heard as threats. They have the opportunity, though, to speak into the lives of their players. They can help mold character. They uphold the importance of practice and perseverance of knowing the rules and playing by them. They model good sportsmanship when the other team doesn't seem to have a clue what that means. Now, this may be an idealization of coaches, but don't we all want someone out there to reinforce the values of good character? Whether they be coaches or music or art directors or teachers, William Willimon, pastor, author, blogger, and retired bishop of the United Methodist Church, asks, who are our mentors and examples of faith? The Christian faith is too difficult to be done alone. We must have worthy models. Timothy had a worthy model of faith in Paul. Verse 6 in our text this morning makes me wonder. He says, For this reason I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. And this is the part that gets me. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Is Paul saying, Come on now, son, shape up. Get with the program. No more sitting on the sidelines. You get in there, get tough, and get going. Reading this makes me think, well, hey, what's up with Timothy? Is he a wimp? Is he a coward? In reality, Timothy was one of Paul's most trusted co-workers. In 2 Timothy, we read that he was the recipient of faith lived out and passed on by his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. They were probably converts from Paul's first mission in Lystra, in Asia Minor, which is what we know today as Turkey. Paul noticed Timothy. 
Timothy had a good reputation in Lystra and was incorporated into Paul's missionary team. Timothy was there for Paul's second and third missionary journeys. He was in Berea. He was in Corinth, in Macedonia, with another member of Paul's missionary team, and he was with Paul throughout Macedonia and Greece. He is the co-author of six epistles. Timothy was important as a co-worker in ministry and as friend, upon whom the apostle depended. Timothy served as Paul's representative. He was Paul's primary emissary, and Paul described Timothy as, as a living example of the mind of Christ. Timothy was well known and highly regarded in the early church. It's possible that the first bishop of Ephesus named Timothy could have been the same Timothy. So much for thinking that something was wrong with Timothy. You knew that humble pie that's going around? Big piece, right here. So why would Paul tell Timothy to rekindle the faith, the gift of God that is within him, and remind him that God gives us a spirit of power, of love, and self-discipline? Let's take a look at the context. Paul is writing to Timothy from a Roman prison. Paul will be put to death in Rome under the reign of the Emperor Nero. And if you want to read more about how Paul ended up in Rome, Go to Acts chapter 25 and read through to the end. And if that gets you going, then read from the beginning. Fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. So here we are, and Paul is facing death. The faith must be carried on to the next generation. Not just any old faith, but the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is as if Paul is saying, I'm going to be gone soon. Gear up. Don't forget the message. Keep up the good work. Rekindle the flame. Yes, times will be tough. And I am thankful that even though everyone else has deserted me, you are still associating with me. Even though it might cost you your life. In that culture, being in prison brought great shame. Anyone who would visit or support the prisoner would also be tarnished by that societal shame. And even though the early Christians were taught that service to the Christian prisoner was indeed service to Christ, the cultural pressure got to the best of them. But not Timothy. When Paul writes, do not be ashamed, he means it literally. But Paul's invitation pushes Timothy just a little bit further. Join with me. Throw off all cultural connotations of who you can or who you should associate with for your own betterment. Rely on the power of God, the God who saved us and called us with a holy calling to be set apart for God's purposes. Paul continues, this holy calling is not according to our own works, but according to God's own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, but has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life right here, right now, and immortality to light through the gospel. Now that is a gospel that I can believe in. That is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ that we can share pass on and live out by God's grace. A good coach can motivate us, but this is more than a motivational talk for Paul. This is the life-giving gospel. And Paul says, for this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. And for this reason, I suffer as I do, but I am not ashamed, for I know the one in whom I put my trust and I am sure that he is able to guard until that day what I have entrusted to him. What do we entrust to the Lord? When we follow Jesus, we entrust our whole selves, not just the good or the nice parts, but our entire selves, the good and the not so good. Jesus accepts 
loves and redeems our entire being. Is this the message that we live out together in the body of Christ to be seen by our youngest disciples, our teens and young adults? We are here today, the body of Christ at Morrisville Presbyterian Church because of the faithfulness of generations who have gone before us. And yes, we have questions. Why isn't the church as full as it used to be? What happened? Who will carry on? How can we attract new members? Is it possible to rekindle the gift of God in our own lives? Listen to this quote from Rachel Evans, daughter of Will Willimon, as she responds to the question, how do we get young adults back to church? What finally brought me back after years of running away wasn't lattes or skinny jeans, and this is a reference to the showy, trendy hip ways of doing church. It was the sacraments, baptism, confession, communion, preaching the word, anointing the sick, you know, those strange rituals and traditions Christians have been practicing for the last 2,000 years. The sacraments are what make the church relevant, no matter the culture or era. They don't need to be repackaged or rebranded. They just need to be practiced, offered, and explained in the context of a loving, authentic, and inclusive community. She continues, church attendance may be dipping, but God can survive the internet age. After all, he knows a thing or two about resurrection. And so do we. 2,000 years later, we are the ones entrusted to carry the message of the gospel. Learning the love of Christ is not about saying, here, take the Bible and read it. You'll be fine. Come back for dinner. It's a matter of the congregation coming together, reaching out, observing, noticing our kids, no matter what age. We have taken vows as a congregation when we baptize infants. Those are not idle words. We are making promises that will affect the body of Christ for generations to come. Church is not just a place to get to on a Sunday morning. It's not only about knowing the rules of the game. It's not just listening to great music or connecting with the preacher. It's about worship and living out the love and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, recognizing the gifts of God in people of all ages, helping to rekindle the gift of God that we see in each other, we are reminded, especially today, of our youngest disciples. Encourage and listen to them as they lead us in worship. You may even remember when they were baptized. And so after the service, do ask a young person to show them their new Bible. Perhaps you can share one of your favorite passages. Take an interest. The Christian faith is too difficult to be done alone. We must have worthy models. Be a worthy model. Amen.